Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Selection, Use, Care, and Maintenance of FRAR Clothing. My name is Ed Rakowski. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Synergist the Magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our listeners for attending today's event, and especially Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring this webinar. Our presenter today is Derek Sang, the Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protective Apparel. Derek has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry for over 20 years. For the first 10 years of his career, Derek worked directly with end users, developing and implementing flame-resistant clothing programs specific to the customer's hazard. Over the past 11 years, Derek has worked closely with Fortune 1000 companies, educating them on the various fabrics, FR technologies, and the dynamics of arc flash and flash fire hazards as they look to develop FR clothing programs. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing. Derek is a qualified safety sales professional, a certified environmental health and safety professional, a certified safety health and environmental technician, and he recently became a qualified trainer for a low voltage based on NFPA 70E. And Derek, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ed, and thank you for that kind introduction, and uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, to those listening, depending on where you're listening uh, to us today. And thank you for doing that. It truly is a, a privilege to uh, share time with you all, and hopefully on, in this next 45 minutes or so, we'll definitely make it uh, worth your while. Uh, what you see on the screen there is uh, labeled the Bulwark F4 Handbook. That's actually a handbook that we made and, and is available that kind of dives a little bit deeper into what we're just going to touch on uh, today. Uh, so I can't find my screen advance, and I just lost my... What do you see? I don't see my little uh, arrows for moving the slides, Regina. Okay, just at the very top of your screen where it says zero one. Nope, I don't have it. I don't have that. That's okay, can you see your can you see your presentation in front of you? Yes. Okay, go ahead and try to hit your uh, space bar. I just hit my space bar and it disappeared. All right, let's see. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We'll get this in just a second. All right, let's see if you can try it again. All right, you went into a different mode. Just go ahead and return out of there for me. There you go. Okay, click on your select use at the very top right. The tab that says selection use, that would be your presentation. But it looks like you're in full screen mode. So yeah, wave, your, of, wave your cursor at the top, and you should see it says exit out of that. There you go. Okay, All there right. we go. Yeah, now click your tab that says selection use. You see it on the right-hand side, right next there. All right, there. now we're rocked. Okay, now we're going gas. Thanks for All getting right. me out of that, Regina. Apologize, sure. folks. Some of the times those things happen. So getting back on track, so we have this handbook that we developed to help folks kind of understand the selection, use, care, and maintenance because we are still making a lot of assumptions in some cases and we're utilizing some misinformation in others uh, when we're implementing uh, our FR clothing, arc rated clothing uh, programs. So obviously the proper selection of PPE is very important. And even though the thermal hazards may be different, if you think about arc flash on one end and flash fire on the other, arc flash, very short in duration, high in intensity, you've got a lot of heat, you've got concussive force, and then on a flash fire side, you've got it's longer in du duration, the heat isn't as intense, and the concussive force isn't present. But if you look at those thermal events, though they may be different, the basic selection, use, and care, and maintenance of FR and AFR, AAR clothing uh, share a lot of similarities. So what we want to talk about today is kind of first and foremost, we're going to look for a regulation. What 
in the law tells us to do. Then once we have, we have that, then we'll look to what do the standards tell us because we all understand the how, okay, or excuse me, the shall, you shall protect your people, and then the how comes from our standards. And if we don't specifically have any guidance there and regulations and standards, we'll look to some best practices. Uh, taking 40 years of experience within the bulwark environment as an FR supplier, we do have from our end user communities things that they do well that may not be standardized or may not be in a regulation, so we'll share those where it makes sense. So obviously we're all pretty clear on this, but let's just emphasize who is responsible for what. When determining who's responsible for worker and workplace safety, where does that fall? It's going to fall on the employer. Think about it, when we don't have a regulation specific to anything, what's the overarching umbrella? The general duty clause. What's the general duty clause say? And in paraphrasing, you will not hurt, maim, or kill your employees. And in order to minimize that, in order to eliminate that, what do you have to do? Well, you have to do hazard assessments, and you have to do hazard assessments so that you can then protect them, so you can provide them personal protective equi equipment for the job that they're doing. So you have to determine what hazards they could be exposed to and protected those hazards. Some of them are very simple and, and easy. Stuff can fall from the sky and hit us on the head. We have hard hats. If things are spinning around in the air and can go in our eyes, safety glasses. If it's over 85 decibels on the job floor, hearing protection. Well, if, we can, if we're working on a 200 amp disconnect or a 480 panel board and we're voltage testing that with the covers off and we could have an arc flash and we have potential for igniting our clothing, we want to protect against that. If we're working in a chemical environment, a refining environment, or an oil and gas exploration environment, and there's potential for exposure to dust, gases, vapors of ignitable liquids, then that's a flash fire hazard. So our hazard assessment is going to determine what properties our clothing now has to have. And what we're talking about here as far as those properties go, those are flame resistant properties. And by flame resistant, I mean they have to, by definition, regardless of the technology, put themselves out. So where do we look to in oil and gas and chemicals and refining? We look to, that's our flash fire hazard, we have some pretty good standards that are going to help me. The bookend standards for flash fire are NFPA 2112 and NFPA 2113. Those are kind of the go-to consensus standards. NFPA 2112, that's written for us, and by us I mean the FR manufacturing community, that's written for us on how to build clothing to protect you, the end user, against flash fire hazards. 2113, as an end user, as a safety professional, if you determine that you have a flash fire hazard, your go-to, your playbook is NFPA 2113. NFPA 2113 is going to guide you through hazard assessment. Once you determine you have a flash fire hazard, it walks you through the selection specification process. And guess what kind of garments they specify you use is NFPA 2112 compliant garments. Notice I didn't say certified. NFPA does not certify anything. NFPA 2112 compliant garments have been certified by an independent third party that all the fabrics, the fibers, excuse me, the fabrics, the findings, and the facilities all meet 2112, and then they can determine that that garment is compliant to the hazard. 2113, as the end user, We've now specified the garment. Once we get the garment, it instructions on how to use it, maintain it, and then uh, care for it. So 2113 for folks that are exposed to a flash fire is pretty thorough. For our general industry 70E folks who have need arc flash protection, their clothing has to be arc rated. Now, 
Don't get confused. All arc rated clothing, by definition, has to be flame resistant. So you start out by being flame resistant, then you apply additional testing in order to become arc rated. Now the good thing is, is there's a large majority of today's garments are going to be dual hazard. By dual hazard, that means inside that garment you're going to see labeling that says it is 2112 compliant, and then you're also going to see labels that have an ARC rating on there. That ARC rating may be an ATPV or an E sub BT, but there's an ARC rating on there. That means that particular garment has been tested to both hazards. What we want to look for when we are looking at ARC rated garments, in general industry, 7E is going to tell us that Regardless of how you kind of boil it down, the simple way is, is you want to have more arc rating than you have incident energy exposure. That's why 70E requires that you do an engineering study on your equipment so that you can tell that electric electrician or that contracted electrician what? You're going to tell him how big a bomb he is standing in front of if that 200 amp disconnect, if that 480 panel arc flashes, what is the incident energy? The incident energy is measured in calories per centimeter squared. So you can, on that box, when you've done your engineering study, you can say that the incident energy of this piece of equipment is 5 calories per centimeter squared. That tells that electrical worker who's in front of it, he needs to have what? More arc rating, which is also in calories per centimeter squared. I need to have more arc rating than there is incident energy. So in the example I just gave you, if it's five calories, he wants to have in his shirt, pant, or coverall at least six calories of protection. Real easy if you know. Now in 70E, they allow uh, some caveats if you don't know. Use the tables. Use the task tables that are in NFPA 70E, or you can use Annex H, the simplified uh, two-step approach to where you are taking on an exposure that is unknown and you're protecting yourself to the unknown. It gives you some guidance. For our electric utilities, very, very similar. They have to do a reasonable estimate of all their equipment, and they are provided within the final ruling in 1910-269, a number of options in order to provide you a reasonable estimate. And again, you match up the outermost layer in calories per centimeter squared versus the incident energy in calories per centimeter squared, and you want to be equal to or greater than that reasonable estimate. So that kind of boils things down to our three primary areas where we have uh, flash fire and arc flash concerns. So where do we start? Now we've kind of given you, okay, here's where we are. Now how do I know in the selection process what my garments can do and how does that help me specify? One of the things that you can start with and by no means is this 100% of the time, and I'll show you why, but one of the prime areas you want to begin your evaluation is look at the labels, look at the information that the manufacturers are required to give you in order to help you make that determination. ASTM 1506, for example, requires all this information be given to you as an end user on that label. You're going to know what your ARC rating is. You're going to have tracking information on that label. Why? Because we want to, if that garment is involved in an incident, we want to be able to go back and tell you what roll of fabric it was cut from, when it was cut and sewn, and most importantly, what is the test data from that roll of fabric. And that's why the fabric folks retain that stuff for up to 10 years, so in case any of these garments from that thing can and uh, be documented and also that chain of custody to where those things are monitored. Now labels by no means, as I said, are 100% infallible. In fact, we've got to be cautious of fraudulent information being communicated to us on labels. Now that being said, you can take this label, for example, this was discovered in uh, California. 
There was 3,000 garments from this manufacturer in service in this company. Now, you'll notice it has the UL label on there, or the UL logo. Within five clicks of the mouse on the UL website, you can determine whether a manufacturer is indeed certified by UL to be NFPA 2112 compliant. When this was researched, this company did not exist with UL. This was a, a fraudulent logo that was placed on there. The other key in, indicator, and I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but if you look closely across the top of that, it says this garment is flam resistant. Now, I don't know what flam is. I'm glad it's resistant to it, but that may be a key. If you can't even get the labeling right, what do you think the other key steps in making that garment flame resistant, how much attention has been paid to that? So what can go wrong when we start looking down the line? When you're building your program, it's shirts, it's pants, it's coveralls. What are some of the other things that you want to factor in when you're building your FRAR clothing program? One thing that is important to understand is remember, it is the outermost layer. On the left there, you see an employee doing a couple things wrong. First and foremost, his shirt's untucked, his sleeves are rolled up, but do we have any idea what that vest is? And it, is it tested to the hazard? Is it 2112 compliant? Does it have an ARC rating? Because now it's the outermost layer. Now, it doesn't have to meet or exceed the incident energy that it's exposed to. It just has to have an arc rating for a, 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 an arc flash because, again, your shirt, pant, and coverall is what you're matching to the energy, not the vest. But the vest does have to be resistant to arc. It does have to have been tested, and it does have to have an ATPV or an ESUB-BT in order to be the outermost layer. So that's some things where you want to delve a little bit deeper. If you're out in the elements and you have to wear rain gear, again, for an arc flash or a flash fire, that is now your outermost layer. That rain gear has to have been tested to the, uh, the hazard. For rain gear, it's not NFPA. For rain gear, it's ASTM. It's ASTM 1891 for arc flash and ASTM 2733 for flash fire. Ideally, in that rain gear, you want to look at that tag and you want to see both ASTM standards. Because why? You could be an electrician out and you could have an arc flash that initiates a flash fire. So you'd kind of like to have uh, both protection. If you are an electrician on a, in a refinery, you have both hazards. You have an orc flash hazard and you have a flash fire hazard. So you would like to see both in your rain gear. That being said, if you have a FRAR program and you have rain gear and vests, do me a favor. Take note of this slide. If you can write down or when you get a copy of this presentation in PDF, go to this slide and take note of the standards. If you go into your tool room or if you go into procurement and you look at the vests and rain gear that you have procured or that you have on site in your tool room, and in those tags there's only one standard, and by that I mean one of these standards, for example, if there's only one standard reference and it's one of these, that should not be implemented in the field if you have an arc flash and flash fire hazard. And here's what I mean. ASTM 2302 is commonly seen in reflective vests to allow them to be marketed to the AR and FR community. That standard is heat resistant, flame resistant. If you read the standard further, it says not to be used in arc flash and flash fire. This ASTM 2302 is the first step in getting to an arc rated garment, but there's so much additional testing that needs to be done as a standalone, it is not going to perform in your hazards because it hasn't been tested to it. If ASTM 6413 is the only standard referenced in your vests or rain gear to allow it to be marketed as FR, this is not a performance standard. It's not designed as a performance standard. You have no idea how that vest or rain gear is going to perform in arc flash or flash fire. 
And then lastly, NFPA 701, we see commonly in reflective vests that are 100% polyester that meet ANSI and are marketed as FR. NFPA 701 is not a garment standard. It is a standard typically used in the hospitality industries for draperies and linens. Again, not tested to your hazard. Be very, very cautious if those are the only standards that you see in a label. The next big piece that we want to overcome when we're putting in our FR and AR clothing program is training, training, and more training. We are required to train on PPE. Your clothing is now PPE. We have to, through 1910-132, train when folks need to be wearing it, what do they need to be wearing, how to properly put it on and take it off, adjust it, etc., and then how to take care of it and ultimately how to dispose of it properly. Then your employees have to demonstrate that they understand that and basically sign off on it. This is a couple ways that your uh, supply chain partners can assist in helping you do these programs. Have your supply chain partners come in and provide training on their products so that your people can understand how to properly uh, wear, wear their garments, care for their garments, maintain their garments. It has to be implemented properly in the field or it's not going to work when you need it to work. Remember, we build these garments to be used hoping you never have to use them for what I build them for. Because I am building these to save your life in an arc flash or a flash fire. I don't want you using them for that. But if you have to, all those bells and whistles have to be in the garment. When do you find out if that manufacturer cut corners? When do you find out if that uh, low cost safety vest that you purchased uh, to save a few bucks is going to fail in the, ha in the hazard? You don't have the opportunity to go back and change that sequence of events. So you need to have the stuff there, hoping you never have to use it. It is somewhat of an insurance policy. So NFPA gives us guidelines. Again, I told you, 2113, great go-to uh, document. All our standards give us guidance on how to properly wear this. Buttoned up, rolled, and tucked in for uh, oil and gas flash fires. Undergarments cannot be made of multiple materials, and ideally we would like to have FR materials as undergarments. FR base layers are making a huge uh, upswing in the program because of the additional protection they provide over all natural garments. In 70E, we have guidance also. NFPA 70E tells us that we have to have our sleeves rolled down, fastened at the wrist, shirts must be tucked in, and that shirts, jacks, and coveralls be closed up to the neck. Now, you're already on the thing going, how do we enforce that? It's, there's a little bit of area there, if you read that correctly, is it the top button? Are we closing all the way to the top? It is up to the neck. You're going to determine where that neck is. Majority of comfort, majority of implementation, it is that top button is undone, the next button is done up. Why? When we're in front of energized equipment, what do we have to be wearing? Hard hat face shield. That face shield and that chin cup are going to protect potentially any of that area that could be exposed where that top button is. So that's, again, looking at a best practice versus the literal interpretation of the standards. Also, undergarments here in 70E can't be made of multiple materials. Wear all natural fibers, or better yet, get that additional arc rating protection of uh, two layers of FR versus just the one. In our electric utilities, we have the same language, though a little bit differently. Now, uh, obviously, things changed in 2014. Uh, up until 2014, when the final ruling came out, we did not have anything in 1269 uh, that spoke specifically to FR arc rated clothing. Now we do. ASTM 1506 is the base that's underneath that ruling for arc rated clothing. ASTM 1506 tells us clothing should cover potentially exposed areas as completely as practical. 
This should include proper interfacing. Now that's a fancy way of saying all you utility guys have to interface your shirts and pants correctly. Shirts and pants are designed to have the shirt tucked in, not hanging out. What's, why are we concerned and why do we talk so much to having shirts uh, tucked in as opposed to hanging out? Now, if you're a welder, you're going to want it to hang out because you want that slag coming off you. You don't want it going into your waistline. Understood. Greater hazard. For electrical workers, we want to have it tucked in because one, it's a hang-up hazard as it's floating around, but secondly, that arc energy, when it goes down to the ground and mushrooms, what happens to hot air? Hot air rises. You have that fireball coming up, lifting or blousing that untucked shirt, and that energy is now going underneath. If you are wearing nothing underneath, you can have potential energy from all that radiant heat. If you are wearing a lightweight 100% cotton t-shirt underneath, you have the potential for ignition. We don't want you having your shirts untucked, and that's the reasons why. I have talked to in the last couple slides, whether it's flash fire protection or arc flash protection, the benefit of arc rated and FR base layers. What's the big benefit? Really, it helps alleviate two uh, concerns. The first concern is who wants to be the underwear police? If you require 100% cotton undergarments or you say there, you can't wear anything that's meltable underneath your, your FR and arc rated clothing, as you walk down the line and you see that little white triangle sticking out of everybody's shirt, are you 100% confident each and every single time that that's 100% uh, cotton? What if it's 80-20? What if it's 50-50? What if it's 60-40? You don't know. Lastly, what if there's a big old logo underneath there that you can't see? Are those potential concerns when it comes to thermal energy? Remember, that outermost layer is absorbing a lot of that energy, but you still have radiant heat, you still have IR, you still have thermal energy passing through that garment. You are not shielded in any way. So what happens when it hits that 50-50 uh, poly-nylon cotton blend, you're going to have a meltable. So that's number one. You eliminate the cotton, uh, the underwear police because all base layer manufacturers are going to have that logo sitting right there so you can easily identify uh, that all your guys are wearing the right stuff. The second thing is, and especially in our electrical utilities, there's a concern for break open. Remember that outermost layer is, has a failure point. It is susceptible to breaking open. By breaking open, meaning that if it's 8 calories protection and I hit it with 15 calories, can it break away? Can it fail? Absolutely. Then you're either exposing your bare skin or your lightweight cotton shirt to whatever incident energy is left over. Arc-rated FR base layers eliminate that concern. So there's a couple of areas right there where base layers are helpful. Meltable undergarments are absolutely a real concern. 100% polyester performance fabrics need to stay in the gym and stay away from thermal hazards, period. We have to be very, very cautious, especially with the influx of younger guys coming in and thinking, well, what's the number one concern? My arc-rated FR clothing's hot. This stuff I wear in the gym keeps me cool and comfortable. I'm going to wear it especially in our oil and gas exploration where we have an influx of a lot of folks who are not necessarily been brought up in that culture and immediately understand not to wear anything meltable. The scars that you see on the left, his FR AR clothing outer layer work perfect. His 100% polyester uh, performance fabric failed miserably and those scars are going to be carried for a lifetime. One of the things that Bulwark and other uh, folks are doing is they're testing outer layers with base layers and it's there now understand it's bulwark over bulwark, carhartt over carhartt, work right over work right. It's not, you know, we're not cross pollinating here, but we're testing our own to give you that information. Now, which base layer is right for you? For our flash fire community where you don't have uh, necessarily a cumulative total from testing, just know this, two FR layers are always going to be better than one FR layer. 
having that FR base layer might allow you to wear a lighter outer layer. There's some advantages there. For our electrical community, they are tested together and you actually have a arc thermal performance value of the combined system. So which one's right for our electrical community? For 70E, for utility, it's going to be long sleeve. Now, is that 100% of the time? Not necessarily. If your hazard assessment determines that you wear rubber sleeves, if you're a rubber sleeve utility, you may allow a short sleeve arc rated base layer and still take advantage of the, the system testing because your rubbers are going to be primary and you will allow them to wear short sleeves. That's your hazard assessment. You determine that and we move forward from there. Uh, correct do's and don'ts. Okay, you implement a coverall program, you have your folks out in the field, how are they properly uh, supposed to wear it? This coverall is zipped up, the sleeves are down. Now, uh, you see on the lower left that we have the arc rated base layer there. In the center one, we have the addition of a mandarin collar. That's not on all uh, garments, that just gives you a little bit extra protection if you do knowingly going into a hazardous environment where you want to protect that neck and then you would don additional balaclava, uh, hard hat, etc. But for the large majority of folks, especially in oil and gas and our refineries, on the far right is going to be how you wear your coverall. Some don'ts, and we see this countless of times when we're doing site, site visits. Uh, the one in the middle, that's very common. You're zipped too far down, your sleeves are rolled up. You're going to have work gloves on there and you're going to have that sleeve rolled up. Not proper implementation. Guys on breaks, guys trying to cool down, guys working in the middle of summer away from the hazard, they're going to do the old waist tie. Then what do they do when they come back to the job? They forget to put it back up. Some other things that we see, not so much now, but back in uh, 2012, 2013, guys slopping around in diesel mud, et cetera, in oil and gas and fracking, uh, using duct tape to uh, make gaiters, and so the, that stuff doesn't get in their boots. That's a meltable, don't do it. Duct tape is not an alternation uh, method or an approved uh, repair method because it's a meltable. Shirts and pants, and I, I've mentioned it three times across all our hazards, tucked in, sleeves rolled down, shirt buttoned up. Some don'ts that we see with our shirts and pants. The most common that I mentioned is untucked. Uh, worse, uh, untucked, sleeves rolled up and unbuttoned because, quote, unquote, we're working de-energized. Well, we all know that the equipment you may be working on de-energized and then equipment to your left and equipment to your right may be energized. So we don't want to be uh, assuming everything, implement your PP again correctly or it's not going to work. In the lower left of your screen there, what's the concern here? You've invested thousands and in some cases tens of thousands of dollars in this PPE program to get shirts, pants, and coveralls on your people who are in harm's way. Uh, what do we do? What's happening here? Is that an ARC rated FR hat? What do we do with bandanas that are 50-50 uh, or 100% polyester? What do we do when we put hard hat liners and things in there? Just other areas that we need to be cautious of. Always, always rolled, tucked, and buttoned. Uh, that arm that's in the picture there, unfortunately, was a failure to verify. You can see all the way to the top, he had rolled up the sleeves of his arc rated shirt. It worked as designed and provided protection to the area that it was covering. The area that was not covering was severely damaged. He had also removed his rubbers and his leathers that would have protected that hand. So again, all was uh, roll tuck implemented properly. Caring for our investment, you've again made these thousands, in some cases tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars investing in your shirts, pants, and coveralls for arc rated and FR protection, what do we do to care and maintain them? All your standards that are relevant to arc flash and flash fire hazards will tell you for the most part, follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Again, we are required to provide you a ton of information. Unfortunately, that tends to be a lot of labels on your shirts.
the fine print on your tag tells you how to care and maintain your shirt, pant, and coverall. If that is too difficult, you can acquire a PDF on how to do that. The good thing is, is that for the most part, following some simple laundry tips and guidelines, it's very hard to mess this stuff up. The core is no chlorine, so no bleach, okay? Makes sense. The sneaky one is also no peroxide. Where does peroxide catches? That's anything with oxy. If you see oxy clean or with oxy or oxy whatever, don't use it. That's peroxide. Peroxide and chlorine are going to have similar effects on the FR properties of your garments. Uh, don't use fabric softeners. Fabric softeners are an accelerant, whether it's a dryer sheet or it's in the uh, the, the laundry cycle, don't do it. If you happen to accidentally do it, just rewash them, not a big deal. Remember, these concerns are over time. These concerns are, how, but we don't know how, is it 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, we don't know. So that, that's why we tell you, don't do it. And then for tough stains, you can use shout, you can use uh, those stain removers and then wash the garments perfectly fine. The one concern is, is if you are working around secondary accelerants and you know that that garment smells like an accelerant and you wash it and it still smells like an accelerant, guess what? It's still an accelerant. Wash it until that fuel odor is gone. Uh, so here are your culprits. Uh, what's the one that you can use? Again, just regular liquid detergent. This one just happens to be tied. Uh, it's not a necessarily have to be tied. That was just the easiest from a visual standpoint. Other things that we put on our shirts, pants, and coveralls that concern during uh, mosquito tick season, uh, insect repellent. Be very, very cautious. Do not put DEET directly on your FR garments. DEET is an accelerant both in the wet form and the dry form. You're putting an accelerant on your clothing. Uh, the DEET folks will tell you it's okay to put directly to the skin. Uh, you might want to look at, at wipes where you can put them on your neck and, and, and on your face uh, accordingly for those exposed areas. The other place to look is look at permethrin-based products or non-DEET products. What you want to do is when you're looking at that manufacturer, they document that they are FR safe. There are a couple of companies uh, that I'm aware of uh, that do that, R&R &R is one, uh, Rainbow is another, and then, for example, uh, Ben's uh, Clothing and Gear, are, they all are FR safe and they've done some form of testing to tell you that. Now, you as the end user are going to determine what works for your team. Uh, Bulwark and others are not going to provide you any guidance, uh, unfortunately, in that area. Uh, you may ask why, well, how much you're putting on, we don't know. Is it a little? Is it a lot? Does it change from whatever the test data? There's just so many variables there and so many different fabrics uh, that it's just we're not in a position to do that, nor is really our space in a position to do that. Soiled garments we've talked about. Staining alone always concerns people. Stains in and of themselves, not a concern. What is a concern is if that stain has a fuel odor and you sniff that and you smell fuel, wash it until the fuel is gone. If you can't get rid of the odor, get rid of the garment. Uh, real quick, visually, these two stained garments, if that is clean, no odor, both are fine. If during the work day, that secondary accelerant on the left, I'm probably going to remove myself from harm's way. I'm not going to work within the arc flash boundary or near the flash fire hazard. If I have to, I'm going to change that garment. The one on the right, even if that's secondary accelerant, you're probably going to make the determination that it's okay to work like that and you're going to continue doing what you're doing. That's not a lot of uh, staining. Now, it's still fuel. It will create a hot spot in an arc flash or a flash fire, but is it enough to cause uh, significant injury and things like that? You're going to have to make that personal determination, but looking at those two visually, that's a very, very uh, small amount of staining potential fuel there. Repairing or replacing. It's gotten a little easier. You can get on that Google box. You can buy Nomex or Aramid thread. You're going to use your old shirts, old pants to uh, provide patching and cut. So you can do that. Uh, what are the guidelines? Less than three inches in a rip. 
less than a nickel size in a hole. Uh, probably easier at the end of the day just to replace it than trying to uh, patch those ones up. Uh, that being said, just some examples. On the lower left there, you're going to see thread born worn out. That cannot be repaired. That has to be replaced. The one in the middle, you see a tear there on the shoulder. Now, if that happens to be less than three inches, you could probably justify repairing that. It's right on the seam. Uh, the one on the far right, though it's on the, the seam that is far greater than three inches, I would recommend that you do not uh, repair that garment. So just real quick as we're wrapping up here, and I know we're going to have some time here for uh, hopefully some questions, checklist, things to kind of uh, look for in going through this selection use care and maintenance process. First and foremost, I always tell people, regardless of who you're evaluating, first and foremost, get the manufacturer's guarantee in writing on letterhead and sign. And what kind of guarantee are you looking for? Flame resistant for the life of that garment. Regardless of the fabric, regardless of the technology, it is not linked to a standard. And what do I mean by that? The guarantee does not say that this is that this meets the NFPA 2112 standard. What are the number of launderings for NFPA 2112? It's 100. 100 is only two years of wear life if you wash it on a weekly basis. Can I have garments that last longer than two years? Absolutely. So what happens when I launder it 101 times? You do not know. That guarantee is over. If it's to ASTM 1506, that's only 25 launderings. Are you going to launder that garment more than 25 times? You cannot have the guarantee linked to a standard. It has to be for the life of that garment. Ask for the test data for the hazard. Fabric suppliers can easily and readily provide those results. Then take one step further and verify it. Call the testing uh, body. Uh, go on the Internet and look up the testing body. Uh, I have seen documented test results where they tell you that fabric is 11.9 ATPV, and when you go and research it, it's a 6.2. So verify that uh, test data from uh, manufacturers. Uh, if you're using reputable manufacturers that have been doing this a long time, probably don't need to take that step. But if it's outside your box a little bit, if it's someone new, don't be shy about verifying that data. Ask to see the garment certification. Has every garment been tested to your hazard? Just because I have one coverall that meets NFPA 2112 and it's compliant, doesn't mean that everything in my catalog has and is. Specify that only certified compliant garments for your hazard are allowed on the job site. And also expand that to your contractors, because understand, remember, your contractors, you want them to be equal or better when it comes to their PPE, because ultimately you're responsible for them. Work with proven supply chain partners. And why do I say this? Remember, everything is perfect. You have a perfect program. Everything is awesome until you have an incident and those shirts, pants, and coveralls have been exposed to the hazard they're supposed to protect your employee against. How did they perform? That proven supply chain partner is going to be there when you need them. They're going to bring to bear technical people, PhDs, science to help you understand if that garment performed as designed, what it was exposed to, how hot it got, were there any secondary accelerants, et cetera. So look for a proven supply chain partner. You want to be able to pick up that phone, and when you dial them, you want to be able to get someone to respond and then someone to get to you. If your supply chain takes you outside, Good luck getting someone from Bangladesh or someone from uh, Beijing hopping on a plane to come help you post-incident. 
and then periodically police your program for compliance. I can't tell you how many programs we've installed with the best of intentions and within 18 to 24 months they're out of whack. Why? We go to NSC, we go to ASSE, we go to VPPA and we see all these vendors and we see this really cool stuff and it's exciting and it's new and we just blanketly approve them into our catalog program for people to choose from. Make sure you're policing that program and you know that it's going to meet or exceed the standards that you have uh, and want folks protected to. So with that, I'm going to head back to Ed for some questions, and uh, if we don't get to your question today, and there's some questions left over and we don't answer them on, on this, I will receive those questions uh, from the folks and I will get you your answer. So that's my promise to you. So with that, Ed, I turn it over to you. Thanks for that great presentation, uh, Derek. Um, we have a few questions in. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or a little less than 15 minutes. Uh, just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Um, the first question uh, we have from Steve, he asks, what material should a logo be made with and how should it be sewn? Great question. And Steve, thank you for that. Uh, the standards will tell you that your logos and your emblems and your employee identification heraldry, in some cases it's referred to, uh, does not have to be flame resistant materials as long as you keep the size to a minimum. And then they don't tell you what that minimum is. The rule of thumb that best practice is you want to keep it to that credit card, excuse me, that business card size. Uh, think of the, the standard uh, picture in your head, that industrial laundry mechanic shirt where he's got his name emblem and his company emblem. That's it. That's the sizes that we're talking about. Those can be non-FR. Uh, in an event, we typically don't see that flash fire or that arc flash igniting those non-FR emblems and then causing injury or transferring the heat to where we have a second degree burn. Uh, so that's kind of why the practice is they don't have to be because they don't factor into the injury. Now, can we categorically say they never will? No, we can't because they're non-FR. How do you counter that? If you want a bulletproof uh, approach, then you can put your logos on. You can make your emblems out of FR materials. And the folks that make emblems like pen emblem, world emblem, etc., they have the ability to do that. So you can get embroidery that's uh, Nomex thread or flame resistant threads and you can get those name emblems and company emblems that are made with FR materials. It's just not required by the standards. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Andre and he asks, is there FR AR rating for footwear? Can you comment on care and use tips for footwear? That's a good question. Now, I'm not a footwear guy, uh, but I can tell you there's nothing in the standards per se other than rubber soles and leather. Leather is very, very resistant to thermal energy. You may get a little bit of shrinkage if there's a lot of energy, but typically we don't see leather footwear factoring in uh, and causing injury because leather is in itself very resistant. Uh, Obviously, with footwear, if we have steel toes and things like that, we don't want the leather worn off. We definitely don't want to be wearing that metal into energized uh, environments. So just, again, some common sense uh, approaches to our footwear. Uh, now, if you have electrical conditions where you need dielectric footwear and things like that, that's not, that's not what I'm commenting on here. Uh, obviously, if there's additional PPE other than that. but Stick with good sound leather uh, uppers and good sound uh, rubber soles and, and you're going to be fine. Okay. Um, Gregory has a question and uh, a bit of an explanation for his question. He says, um, he asks, how would you recommend approaching PPP, PPE assessment for service techs such as HVAC repair or elevator repair? He says their, their customer's facilities may not have an arc flash survey, and as a vendor, 
a tech doesn't have the ability to evaluate electrical components of a facility beyond the equipment they are there to service. That is a very, there are more questions in that short little paragraph, Ed, than we we have a lot of time to, de to deal with. Uh, sure. If we had a 70E, 45 minutes here on 70E, we could definitely talk to those. But let me just go real quick. HVAC and elevator slash escalator slash those guys. Uh, HVAC, HVAC definitely under 70E. Uh, our uh, elevator and escalator guys uh, should be under 70E. Uh, now, they're going to fall under uh, What's the greater hazard? For example, if they're dealing in, in closed spaces where they have a lot of moving parts and they have the potential of getting a sleeve caught in something, they'll always make the argument that they want to wear and can wear short sleeves because the greater hazard is not arc flash. The greater hazard is my sleeve getting caught in something that's moving and pulling me in. Uh, not enough time here to, to argue those points, but both of them should be following 70E from a general industry uh, standpoint, my exposure to energized equipment and protecting myself. Now, the bigger question in, in that, that paragraph you gave me is what do I do if I don't know how big a bomb I'm standing in front of, a.k.a. the person I'm servicing has not done their uh, arc flash study, they haven't done their engineering study, and the equipment's not labeled. Uh, 70E allows us a couple of things. One, you have the tables. You will go and look at the tasks that you are doing. The tasks will tell you immediately, do I need PPE or not? It's yes or no. If it's yes, you flip the page and you follow down and it'll tell you category one, two, three, or four protection, then all the additional things you need to wear, hard hat, face shield, rubbers, leathers, hearing protection, eye protection, et cetera. So you can use that uh, if you wanted to. The other approach that a lot of electrical contractors implement is Annex H. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than the definite than what I'm going to tell you here, but basically, it's category two, cat two, shirt, pant, or coverall. Cat two is eight calories or higher protection. Daily wear. So typically it's going to be a shirt or pant that I wear every day that has greater than eight calories of protection. Then I'm going to assume that all electrical equipment under 1,000 volts is, is going to be cat two. I'm going to have my hard hat, my face shield, rubbers, leathers, balaclava, et cetera and my insulated tools, and I'm going to treat that unlabeled equipment as CAT2 under 1,000 volts, then over 1,000 volts, I'm going to assume that I have to wear a CAT4 flash suit. Now, that's a very oversimplification for this uh, format that we have, and you would have to get the 70E booklet and read Annex H and implement it correctly but that's a simplification for how you deal with equipment that is not labeled. And hopefully that helps, because that's really a long, a much longer answer is needed, but uh, for this format, hopefully that does help. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, Chuck has uh, a pair of questions. Uh, he asks, can you comment on whether anti-static FRC is necessary? And he also asks, is it of any value with quote unquote, normal safety shoes, since those can't dissipate the static buildup? Great questions, not easy answers, or I should say not easy in, in this format because it, they, they, they will take a little bit of time. But to summarize for static, if your concern is nuisance static, and that's what we're talking about here, uh, most FR fabrics are going to be fine above 20% relative humidity. If there is going to be a concern of nuisance static in FR fabrics, it's going to be below 20% relative humidity. So it's either going to be cold and dry or hot and dry. Uh, nuisance static uh, can be eliminated by using something like Nomex 3A. The A in that is anti-stat. You have a carbon fiber that goes into 
that fabric which allows the eliminations of nuisance static. Anything beyond nuisance static, you're going to have to be grounded. And that's a completely, that's outside my realm of, of uh, comfort and it's outside my realm of expertise. But as far as nuisance static, the only way to assure that that does not happen is to use fabric like Nomex 3A in your shirts, pants, coveralls, jackets, et cetera. Okay. Um, Pat asks, does NFPA 2112 require FR gloves? It's going to require that you protect the exposed areas. It does not directly talk to hands. Now, hands would be exposed. Uh, good leather work gloves, like I said, leather is somewhat resistant to thermal energy. Uh, there are FR gloves available in the marketplace. They tend to be pricey. Uh, the concern is wearing something that is synthetic and exposing that to thermal energy and having those synthetic gloves melt uh, onto your hands. We are finding that our glove manufacturers are making more uh, FR gloves available. They're making them more economically because we can get Kevlar wo uh, woven in there, which provides cut resistance and others. Uh, there's other FR that we, you wouldn't necessarily see in a shirt, pant, or coverall, but can be very effective in a glove. The, uh, the challenge is getting those price points down so that they can be used uh, at, as disposable as some of these gloves are in our 2112 environment, especially with our, our uh, exploration and drilling guys, they burn through gloves. And unfortunately, that tends to be a piece that ends up missing in their overall FR PPE exposure. But ideally, you would want to have some FR properties in those gloves and definitely not have something that's a meltable. Okay, now we have uh, time for one more question, Derek. Uh, this is from uh, Steve. He asks, I heard bleach should not be used to launder Nomex. Does bleach break down Nomex? The easy and quick answer is no. Uh, Nomex, uh, and again, we would need longer time. Nomex, common uh, nomenclature for Nomex is it's inherently flame resistant. Those fibers in and of themselves, those FR properties are very, very hard to, uh, to break down because it's actually in the DNA or the molecular structure of the fiber that's flame resistant, if that makes sense. Bleach, though, is going to weaken fibers. Bleach is going to make something less protective. It's not necessarily going to take away the FR properties. It's just not going to be as good as it as it should be. Uh, think about it. If I'm a if I'm a strong, vibrant young man at age 25, uh, I'm a lot more resistant to my environment than I am at 75. So if you think about bleach and peroxides as of rapidly aging that fiber, just for pure uh, visualization here, it's not going to be as effective at 75 as it is at 25. We want to keep it at 25. So don't use bleaches, don't use peroxides. They weaken fibers and thus they weaken your protection. And you don't want it to be weak when you need it. Okay, and uh, it looks like we're just about at the top of the hour. Derek, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, that was terrific. Uh, also, thank you to Bulwark Protective Apparel for sponsoring today's webinar and to all of our listeners for your attendance today. Uh, please be on the lookout for announcements of future Synergist webinars.